unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. The Gospel of St. John chapter 15, verses 15. Jesus says, Henceforth I call you not servants. He says, For the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I called you friends. The Bible says, For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. I have made known unto you. Now, for us to have bearing of where we're beginning from on this, it begins again with Jesus Christ and the men that are in his life, the men that walk with him. The men who I believe were very bemused, amazed. They were very shocked at the things they saw around this one man. Of course, history had not recorded such greatness before. And being raised a normal man and, you know, living a normal life, there is this figure that comes into their life. And this man is no ordinary man. By him, the lame are walking. By him, the blind receive sight. By him, the dumb are speaking. I don't know that some people have imagined what it was like to live around such a man in a time where nothing like that was happening anywhere in the world. Today, it's different. There's many men of God who are scattered across the world with very definitive fires, and wherever they are, at demonstrating the power of God in such a might and glory like history has never seen before. Why? Because Christ is going to be with the Lord. He said, it's a good thing that I go. For if I do not go, he shall not send you the comforter, the counselor, the paracletos. The Spirit of God is now in us. And all that Christ did on the earth, the body of Christ is mandated to do even more. Before all of this happens, you see Jesus Christ alone, these men are walking with him. They're seeing him raising dead people, giving life to cold bodies, doing all sorts of miracles, signs and wonders. And they feel that there's a big abyss. There's a big difference. There's a big chasm between him and them. There's just a way he's so deep to be interpreted for them. But he's worth everything. Okay, He's worth everything following him, and walking with him. But I believe that in the back of their heads, they used to ask themselves, who are we to this man? And when John 15, 15 comes through, and this is Jesus Christ himself speaking to these men, he's telling them, look, I call you not servants. You have been elevated as my disciples. Now we have to go beyond servant because if I was to deal with you as a servant, the Bible says the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. It's not the place of a servant to know what the Lord or their master is doing. All right? He says, but I have called you friends for all the things that I have heard of my father I have made known unto you. And Jesus is telling them the basis of our friendship is my ability to give you all that the Father has made known unto me. To give you all that I've heard of the Father. That's what defines our friendship. That is the basis of our friendship. To reveal to you all that I've heard of the Father. I want you to see how Jesus Christ, how God relates with us in what you and I call friendship with him. All right? Because the world has a different idea about friendship. And God has a different idea about 
friendship when it comes to relating with humanity. And Jesus here started to bring us this definition to help us understand when Christ says that I am your friend or you are my friend, what does that mean? It means that all that he has heard of the Father, he gives, all right? He has given them. He has given them. So these men were so privileged to have that opportunity to receive all that the Christ had heard from the Father. Of course, why did Jesus use that analogy? Why did he use that kind of context? Okay? It is because all through in ancient cultures, even up to now, there is a way masters deal with their servants in the household. All right? There are things that servants in a house are not supposed to know simply because they are servants. They're servants. All right? Many of them are simply on a temporary assignment to get from one level to the next level. And when they get to the next level, they are gone. And it's not wrong for your servant uh, to prosper under your hand. That's the way of the anointing. I tell people that if you have a servant in your house and they're living with you for years and nothing on them is growing, nothing on them is elevating, then as a master, there's a problem with you. You have to search yourself. They have to grow, and that's okay. They grow and they move on. Some of them will have families. You know, you've got a housemaid, and she's worked for you two, three, four years, or one year. And then, you know, tomorrow she tells you, see, I found a man who's going to marry me. It's a good thing because that has happened under your household. It means that your household is blessed, all right? So you have to examine yourself if all your servants are failing or they never stay. There should be something in that house. A dwelling is supposed to be a dwelling of peace, glory, and elevation, even for those that are in our confines. Anyway, I was saying that it is not given for servants to know certain things, and Jesus assured us the distinction between servants and friendship. He has said, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, what his master doeth. All right? The language servants receive is command. Do this. Do that. They never get the reason of why that command is given. They're not seated at the place of the heart of the master to share the deepest convictions and alignments. You know, that's not the place of a servant. The place of a servant is simply to obey a command, do this and do this. And then after here, do this. And they're simply paid or rewarded against how much they obey the commandments that are given them. But they're never shown the bigger picture. They're never shown the vision of the household. They're never shown the plans, the tenures. In fact, many servants are not even in the plans of certain households in the long run, in the future of many years ahead. Some are, or in fact all, could be in the short-term plans. But in the long-term plans, many servants are not in the plans of many of the people that they are working with. All right? Jesus gets to these men and tells them, look, I want to have a relationship with you that will take you way farther than simply receiving commandments for me to do so to please me so I would reward you to a place where I want to make you friends that I will reveal to you all that I have heard of the Father. So this friendship is an invitation to a higher place. One day I was asleep, and in my sleep, the Spirit of the Lord created a very mighty encounter. And I remember the Lord Jesus Christ coming through in my sleep and awakening me. He woke me up, and in waking me up, my body started to come, you know, out of the sleep. So I was a bit conscious of the surrounding physical, and yet I was still caught up. And it's almost as though as I was waking up fully, he caught me in the spirit and threw me in the place of vision. And then he showed me two things that I would want to share with you. He showed me the excitement, all right, of what the word, the revelation, huh? of the spirit of God what it does to the human spirit, what it does to the soul, what it does to the body. And I cannot express this beyond the language that is human because many times human language is short of expressing spiritual phenomena. But I could relate with that experience because I've worked with God for so long that I can tell when something is fresh, all right? And in this realm of revelation, there are two things that I think I could share with you. There's a difference between the things that are handed down to you in the place you're at 
and the things that you find in your elevation, you know. It's one thing for God to find you where you are, and then he throws an ounce of revelation in your spirit. He gives you a vision. He gives you a certain understanding from where you are. And it's another for you to exercise yourself in the way of the spirit, for you to soar to the spirit. And because of that, you are elevated spiritually. And in this elevation, there are things you find, all right? There's a difference between the things that find you and the things that you find as you are aligned and waiting on God and seeking the face of God. There are things that find men by simply reason of the gifting, by simply reason of the office. There are things that find me because I'm apostolic. I don't look for them. There are many times God has seized me either in my sleep or when I'm driving or when I'm seated and I'm caught in the spirit and I'm taken to places and I have no control of what's happening, although I'm awake and cautious of everything that is happening. And things are spoken to me, and I know they're not my mind, they're not my thinking. I could not imagine them. In fact, I have to go back and actually search them out for my brain to reconcile, all right? But there are also things that I seem to sort of stumble into when I'm praying and seeking the face of the Father. Those two things are different, okay? So God has given me the grace to carry the sense of the understanding of both things. So in understanding his judgment, I know the things that find me in my apostolic office or the things that I stumble into when I apply myself to seeking his face and waiting on him. And every believer needs that. But also, he told me, see, in all of this, whether they will find or whether you'll be elevated to them by reason of your availability to me, by you abiding in me, by you giving me time to dwell in my presence, all right? The most important thing, and this is the thing he emphasized most, I remember, in the Spirit, is where you dwell in that particular time and period according to the season of my purpose, all right? And so it's in Christ, it's in God to speak to us, to relate with us according to where we are in the places we are dwelling spiritually, our habitation. The Bible says he has appointed the times and their boundaries of habitation that they might seek after. If faptly they might feel after and find him. We find the God we feel after and we feel after as we seek after. And we seek after because our habitations are defined. I'm not just talking about physical habitations. I'm talking about spiritual habitations, all right? But you see, sometimes there's a mismatch between your dwelling place, spiritual, and your expected place of dwelling according to the season in which God is moving. And the wisdom to reconcile both is what makes you relevant in your generation. And I believe that we have one life, you and I that is listening. We have one life. We have one opportunity. There is one just this lifespan that you have on the earth. And certain things come once or twice in the circle, you know, of the prophetic. They come once or twice in a lifetime in the circle of the prophetic. You know, and as these circles either, you know, become smaller or bigger, you know, they define just how long certain things come and appear in human history. And some things appear once and some things appear twice and some things appear multiple times. And that's how you know that you are blessed, okay, to have certain experiences. For example, we are in a time and season of COVID. Many people are looking at the people that are dying, and of course people have died. You know, our heart goes out to the families that are suffering loss, right? But when was the last time the earth had such a plague? And why has the cycle formed you and me alive? All right? And we can either let that cycle fly off, you know, like a mosquito on a wall, it's just, you know, funny it over and it goes. Or we can study the hour to understand why were we alive in the days of COVID-19? Why were we alive in the days when lockdowns came and quarantines were everywhere and hotels were shut and airports were shut and men were buried by the tens of thousands across the world and the whole media was held glued to this one thing that has frustrated businesses, has you know, taken away livelihoods and many people are starved. Some have spent months and weeks without seeing their own loved ones. The question is, why has this cycle formed you and I? And what is God telling us? You know, it's very important. And the question is, are you as a believer positioned in the place where God must find you and the place in which you must find certain things that are available for the people? 
that are positioning themselves in this season. These things are important, and that the wise, the prudent, and the mature. It might not be easy for somebody who has just gotten born again two weeks or four weeks ago to understand what I'm saying. But hey, that's the place of the apostolic. We minister to both. We minister to the person that is growing up and the person that is matured. You know, but to those of you who are mature, you understand the wisdom, and I pray that this will sort of set up a place of prayer in your life and seeking God deliberately for your place. And this is what I've been doing for the season, to be where God wants me to be spiritually, to be found and find, okay? To be found and find. When I seek, it's a very beautiful place, and God is speaking quite a lot. You can tell if you're mature, you can discern that God is speaking to us in this hour more than ever before. But he's saying, now I am not dealing with you as a slave or a servant. I'm dealing with you as friends, all right? Now, that doesn't take away that when Paul is introducing himself, he calls himself a bond servant of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The most important aspect of the word there is bond. Bond means by choice. You can never become a bond servant until you're firstly freed from servanthood, okay? So when servants worked for people for years, back in history, Middle East, they used to get to a point where, you know, they became rich, were established, and some of their masters were satisfied with the work they had done, and they thought they wanted to let them go to their next life or just release them for freedom. So when they released them for freedom, some of these servants, instead of going to start their own homes and do whatever they had to do because their masters had treated them well, they decided to become bond servants. Bond servants mean they're saying, you have freed me, but now allow me to serve you by choice because I have a great relationship with you. And many of those actually became sons and daughters in the household in which they served. That is why when Abraham is weeping before God that he has no seed, he has a servant in his household called Eliezer. All right? He had gotten a relationship with Eliezer, and he knew that if he should not have a child, he could not have a child or may not have a child, he might give that responsibility to Eliezer to take over all his wealth. He had a great relationship with this man. So some of them would grow into a certain relationship. So when we say we are servants of God, we're not talking about the servants that are bound. You understand? We're talking about people who are by choice in this freedom still chosen to serve him. And I believe that every minister of the gospel should be in that position. So don't confuse bond servant and the servant that Jesus Christ is talking about in John 15, 15. There were things that were not given, you know, to servants. And now if you go back even in history, right, biblical history, you will find that even in the places of worship, even when God spoke to different men and women, there were places these men and women could go because of what God had spoken to them. But you realize that there was a way they could not take their servants there. They could not engage their servants into those places because it was wrong. There are things even God would speak with some men and women of God or he wanted to release to some men and women of God in biblical history. But then he had to say, look, if this has to be given you, this cannot be given you in the presence of a servant because it's not for the servant to receive. It's a divine principle. I'll give you an example. One time, in 1 Samuel chapter 9.25, if you read the Amplified Version, the Bible says when they had come from the high place into the city, the Bible says Samuel conversed with Saul on the top of the house. And the Bible says, And they arose early about dawn, Samuel called Saul, who was sleeping on top of the house, saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. And the Bible said, And Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out on the street. And as they were going down the outskirts of the city, the Bible says, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant to pass on before us. And he passed on. But you stand still first, that I may cause you to hear the word of the Lord. Okay? God had a prophetic word to give Saul yeah, concerning the times and seasons. And when Samuel the man of God is walking with Saul in the streets. He finds that this is rema. This is divine instruction. It is sacred. It cannot simply be given to everyone. He tells him, you know what? Tell your servant to pass on. Let him go ahead of us and give us some space because there's some words I need to share with you. And these are words the servant should not hear. So when Jesus says, you are no longer servants 
but a friend. He's saying, I want to just go beyond me telling you, do this, do that, do that, do that. But I want us to get to the level where I can connect with you and reveal the heart of God. That is an invitation to a higher level of the presence of God and his purposes. An invitation of God on a higher level of the presence of God and his purposes. It's a great, great privilege to belong there. It's a great experience to belong there. And in history, of course, the Bible speaks of how Abraham was a friend of God. Unfortunately, when people hear the word friend of God, many people think that it was only Abraham which was a friend of God. But before Abraham was a friend of God, even Moses was a friend of God. And I'm going to prove it in Scripture. The Bible says in Exodus 33, verse 11, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, the Bible says, face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, the Bible says, departed not out of the tabernacle. All right? God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Moses was a friend of God. Moses was a friend of God. And that is why he spoke to Moses face to face. That's what he does when you relate with him in a friendship. And to understand this, there was a time when Aaron and Miriam have an issue. Okay, They contend with Moses, the man of God, because he has married a Cushite woman. And they believe, according to you know the ancient instruction, that a man, a Jew, an Israelite, would not marry outside his own people. And then they're saying, look, what's wrong with Moses? Does he not know that we too hear God? And indeed, Aaron and Miriam used to hear God, but not like Moses used to hear God. And then in Numbers, he summons them. Read the Amplified Numbers 12, verse 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision and speak to him in a dream. He says, But not so with my servant Moses, for he is entrusted and faithful in all my house. And he says, with him I speak mouth to mouth directly, clearly, and not in dark speeches, for he beholds the very form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Yeah. So he was a man of God. He was a servant of God. But he had a certain friendship with God. All right, Because God spoke to him face to face as a man would speak to his friend. There is no way God would speak to Moses face to face, mouth to mouth, without a certain relationship. There was a friendship that Moses had with God even though he was a servant. All right? There was a friendship. There was a certain relationship that this man had with God. There was a certain relationship that he had established with God. He says as a man would speak to his friend. That means Moses had a certain friendship, albeit he was a servant, but he had a certain friendship. All right? I am a servant of God, a born servant of Jesus Christ, but I have a certain friendship with God. I have a certain friendship with God, okay? So that friendship elevates the place of your communion with God. Some people think that God speaks to us the same way. God does not speak to all men the same way. He speaks to certain men and women differently from the way he speaks to other people, all right? In fact, many people are to the things that are handed down to them, not the things that they are elevated to to stumble into. All right? Many people simply have to read a book, you know, have to listen to a CD, have to watch a man of God, have to see this, have to see that. And many of our brethren don't even know what to listen to, who to listen to, and who not to listen to, because for some people, when messages leak similar, they think that the voice and the spirit is the same, and the understanding is the same. You know, this man speaks like the other, this one speaks like the other, I think, because they all speak the same, therefore, no, there's a cluster of people that can minister to you, but it's just a cluster. Even though they speak the same language, the same message, there's stuff that underlines, there's a certain authority in the spirit that is defined. In fact, like one apologist, Chesterton, said, sometimes the fear of the deluded generation is not the fact that men stop to believe in God. But the most frustrating experience is when men are able to believe anything. Okay? It's one thing for some to say, oh, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. But it's another when a man 
because he does not believe in God, he starts to believe in many things and anything. All right? Anything. Sometimes when I listen to people, for example, the proponents, the people who have been pushing for theories like Darwinism, the evolution theory, sometimes I'm like, these guys, they judge us as Christians that we have faith, but that is too much faith. <laughs> It's too much faith to believe that a human being came out of a monkey. It's too much faith. They probably even have more faith than what many Christians understand. So I don't think their issue is faith. I think their issue is believing the wrong thing and being able to believe everything. And that's the challenge of modernism. And postmodernism effects are now heading through the world. I am going to a place where I'm starting to think that every other day humanity is ceasing to think like they should think. Some people are doing things. Christian or not, the people who are doing things, and you're like, but are we thinking anymore? Humanity is stopping to think. People no longer have a heart. You know, they are heartless. People are doing things, not only outside the faith, but even in the Christian faith. That would shock you. And I believe that evil has, you know, become more apparent in this generation than it has ever in the history of the world. But I believe that the grace of God abounds in all this for us being increase so the grace of God increases also. And I believe that salvation is available. But back to what I was trying to express here. God wants to take us to a place of a certain friendship. He wants to relate with us in a certain place of friendship. And when he does that, this defines your place, the place with which where which you hear God. And like I said, not all of us hear God the same. Some people hear him on one frequency, others hear him on another frequency. Some people even hear devils, and they assume that it is God speaking. You know, But later, the results, the fruit of the Spirit, starts to mold through, and you can tell whether this is a man that is actually walking under the Spirit of God or not. You know, The wisdom of heaven from above is clear. You know, It is pure. And out of that purity, it becomes peaceable. You know, and out of that peaceableness, it becomes gentle, it's easy to entreat, it's full of mercy, good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. In Proverbs, the Bible says that wisdom is hewn on seven pillars of the wisdom of God, right? Moses had a face-to-face experience with God. Even in his servanthood, there was a certain friendship God shared with him, albeit I don't think that it was as amplified as the friendship that God shared with Abraham, right? Our father. We are the seed of Abraham, you know what scripture says. Now, the Bible says in Genesis 18, verses 17, I want to give you an experience of the kind of relationship Abraham had with God, the kind of friendship that he had with God. A lot was revealed to Abraham. He knew way more. You know, the scriptures first seen that God would justify the Gentiles through faith. He went afore and preached this gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. That was the relationship that was built, as it was with Moses. But even though Moses was a lawgiver, Moses had the understanding of the grace message. You know, the righteousness of faith speaks this wise. It's quoted in Deuteronomy. These men knew, and the children of Israel were not led through the way of the Philistine, even though it was shorter. They went 40 years of what could have been a few days into the promised land. Moses knew the ways of God. He just had to deal up as a servant and a man of God. And because he loved the people, he found himself compromising to be with them and walk along the way in the bond of love. But that doesn't mean that he was as Israel was. He was elevated above that. He had a certain friendship. So it is with Abraham. When you read Genesis 18 in how God instructs Abraham that there are seven people coming and then three fellows come. And when these men come and they stand by him, he bows down himself to them and he says, please do not depart from me. If I found favor in your sight, do not pass by me. I pray thee for thy servant. Let me fetch you some water. And then the Bible says he washed their feet. And after washing their feet, he went and told his wife, Sarah, let's make meat for them. You know, he prepares a meal for them. And when they make some cake for them, they bring it to these men. And then he goes to the servant and tells them, look, let's slaughter an animal for them. And then they slaughter an animal for them. And then they eat. He knows he has received God in his household. Okay? God loved Abraham to a place where even in the flesh, he came to him. You know, through these three individuals, angelics that were sent to him, and then he attends to them, and after they are full of food, he tells them in the appointed time, in this time, Sarah shall have a son. And the Bible says when Sarah had it in the tent that was behind them, she laughed. And she said in herself, how can I 
have children because I'm stricken of age and I'm not able to have children. We are old people, you know. And to show you the friendship that Abraham had with God. See how, you know, God is speaking through these angelics. You know, why did Sarah laugh? Uh, saying that, how can I surely bear a child when I'm old? And, you know, Sarah says, no, I did not laugh. You know, she denied, saying, no, 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 I did not laugh. But to show the love God has for this house. No, no, she laughed. And then, you know, he goes off that. He goes off that. You know, God doesn't linger on that. Oh, okay, now, because you have even lied and called me a liar, yet we know you laughed. We have changed our mind. We're not going to give you a child. No, that was not the relationship. It was more of why Sarah laughed when we say she's going to. This is God through these men. He's showing his heart and friendship that he has with this man. Okay? Why Sarah laughed? All right? He knows that there is doubt in our heart. But the friendship that he has for Abraham and his household is way stronger, way bigger to be, you know, frustrated and insulted by the small weakness of a doubting woman. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I didn't laugh. She denied, she says. I said, no, but she laughed, Sarah. Anyway, they buried it that way. There was no consequence to her laughter. The word of God still ensued to his servant. All right? And then these men are supposed to turn through to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when God is going to do something, he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. In the 17th verse of Genesis 18, he says, shall I hide this thing, the thing which I'm about to do, my servant Abraham? Shall I hide it? He feels convicted, God, Jehovah God, feels convicted to hide anything of his doing to Abraham. Why? Because he was his friend. He was his friend. He was his friend. He was a bond servant, but a friend. He says, how can I hide this? I don't know whether God will elevate somebody's understanding to see what I'm saying. For heaven to start planning for the earth, and when heaven is planning for the earth, he says, but how can I hide this from my man? How can I hide this from my friend? How can I hide this from my servant? How can I hide this? How? How can I take it away from this man? I cannot hide it from him. And before we know that, God is desperate to pour his heart. He's desperate to pour his heart to his friend. He's desperate to share his heart with his men. And interestingly, in history, these are the two major men that we see debate with God over his decision. You understand? Because that's when now the misunderstanding comes through. Abraham has a problem. He starts to ask God, if I found favor, it's humble, you know, but it is deliberate. Let's find out. What if there are 50 men that have not bowed to the devil? Will you destroy a whole city? And God says, no, I will not destroy it. What if there are 45? And God says, no, I will not destroy it. What if there are 30? No, I will not destroy it. What if there are 20? No, I will not destroy it. Okay, one last time I'll ask, what if there are 10 people that are righteous in that city, Sodom? Will you destroy the whole city? God said, no, I will not destroy that whole city. He ended on the 10th. Eh? Anyway, let's go back to the narration we have. A similar situation happened in the days of Moses. God comes to Moses and he wants to destroy the children of Israel because of their continuous rebellion against him. But you see, it is hard for God to do it without telling Moses. He comes to Moses, Moses, allow me to destroy these people, you know. I'll make you another number of people. Moses says, uh-uh. If you do that, they will think that you got us out of Egypt to destroy us in the wilderness. The testimony will die. And God changed his mind over that affair. These men could change divine purpose, divine plans, because they had a certain place with God where he could hear their heart. They were his friends. Even when he would make up to say, I'm going to do this, but he would change his mind over some of these decisions. He changed his mind over Moses. He did not destroy those people like he had planned immediately. Why? Because Moses tried and he huggled with God. He debated with God in love and in humility. Wow, what a relationship. I don't know that you see what I'm saying. What a relationship that God is planning to do some so big. And not only goes to his servant and friend to tell, but they even have a conversation. What if they're this? What if it's this? What if it's that? I will not do that because you've said, oh, what a rich experience. What a rich glory. But to see that men walked and lived with God in such harmony and relationship, in such places of the Spirit, it baffles and amazes me. 
for those of you who love God, who love Jesus Christ and his word, you understand what a priceless position it is to have, to be able to talk with God and God talking back with you, not only as a servant receiving command, which was okay to serve God that way, but to elevate us to places where he'll even engage us in conversations because he's frustrated and he has to talk to you because he knows you have the ear and you have his heart and you have the understanding with which he can relate and have conversations with you touching the future. What a place. What a place. And something comes to my heart to share with you, okay? It is something that I think I will leave for those of you who are mature, okay? Those of you who are heels, the mature sons, not the peers, not the babes, but I'm talking about the mature sons, the heels, all right? Those of you who have matured into understanding the patterns and principles of God, into understanding the place of, you know, sonship and serving in ministry and, you know, waiting and attending to the things of the Spirit. I want to show you something that grips my heart here. I'm going to take you a little bit back to when the Bible says the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. You will remember that as he returns to the camp, the Bible says his minister, Joshua, the son of Nun, Exodus 33, the Bible says did not depart from the temporary prayer tent. Joshua did not depart from the tent. While the man of God was seeking God on the higher plane, he stayed in the temple as a minister because he knew if anything comes up, you know, by the man of God from the mountain, I have to be available in the most connected place of God's presence to attend to him. I might be needed for the hour. But we also see a likeness of Abraham serving these men. The Bible says he waited on them as they ate, all right? It was as though, like Joshua, the son of Nun, served the distinctive grace that was on Moses. We also see that in that elevation later, in another account in the story of Abraham, we see him as well waiting on these men even as they are eating. Okay? And in that I start to see spiritually that when you're dealing with the laws of inheritance you know, and the power of impartation, it's important for you to get and connect to the wisdom of greatness that serves and avails itself to men that are anointed, to the ministers of God. Because it, it takes a certain wisdom, and a certain wisdom that comes only in the greatness of the Spirit. Okay? When you have a certain seed of greatness, there are certain wisdoms that start to come in your life, that start to connect to your understanding. And one of those wisdoms is to be available, okay? to be present in service of the anointing. And for those of you who are simply churchgoers, you go to church, you go on Sunday, you pray, you fast, you give, but you've not yet connected yourself to really serve an anointing, probably the seed of greatness in you is not yet realized. Greatness serves. Greatness serves. And it's in the wisdom of that greatness to wait on anointed people to avail itself and serve faithfully to those that the Lord has anointed. But also, I have also realized through this that generational graces, generational anointings are bestowed on men who have learned to position themselves before men with deep graces. When you are in a generation and you find a man or a woman who has a distinct anointing, something special about him or her. Because of that seed of greatness, the wisdom in you, you realize that it's more than just serving because you have a seed of greatness, but I've realized that generational anointings have been handed over to men, have been bestowed upon men who know how to position themselves before men and women with deep graces. When you can connect that this man or woman has a certain distinction on him and there's a grace on him that is special, when you stand before him, wait on him. Avail yourself and serve such things. You'll be amazed that generational anointings fall on such men. It is no mistake that when God was looking for a successor, to take the responsibility of leading the children of Israel after Moses was gone, God chose a man that stayed in the tent. The man, Joshua, the son of Nun, that did not depart from the prayer place. Because as God's servant Moses was on the mountain seeking, 
Joshua was also in the tent of meeting as well, the minister of Moses praying. He was praying, God, I don't know what you're dealing with this man, but I pray that my spirit, I think Joshua's heart is praying, will connect to what you are dealing or what you're doing to this man. I'm waiting and available for him. It's the same thing with Abraham. When these three men come, the angelics are sent, and God comes in these three men. You see him cooking for them. You see him, you know, arranging meat for them. You see him not sitting on a table with them, eating with them as though they are his equals. No, he is waiting on them like a servant would wait on his master. And guess what? Immediately, the posterity of that man's generation is defined by giving him an inheritance, an heir, an heir. Remember his problem, I go childless. Now God has answered that I'm going to preserve the next generation for you. That's why I spoke of generational anointing. So I spoke about the inheritances of the Spirit, the power of impartation. It's to men who have that wisdom that is birthed from the seat and foundation of greatness and have learned to be available and to serve certain anointings. More so when you start to realize that somebody has a certain grace, when a man has a certain deep grace, you will realize that the generational anointings, the things that make you distinctive in your generation, they begin when you know how to serve certain anointings. And although I'm not at liberty to share my life, I have served some people that the world will never even know that I've served in ways the world will never know. But I don't want to give examples because some people might not understand me or because they might not know my convictions of why I have done the things that I've done over the years. But if some of you know the kind of people we've knelt before, the kind of people we've honored before, some men whose names we did not mention when we were seated. You know, it's not that we are worshiping these men or that they are God, but we understand the power of a generational anointing. It's one thing to be a piece on the chessboard. It's another to be the player on the chessboard. It's one thing to be among the voices of that generation, and it's another to be the voice in your generation. And that's for people, again, who hunger, you know, for higher responsibilities. But, you know, we're saying that when you are elevated to the place of friendship, God's communion with you changes. You are invited to a certain presence, a certain level of presence. But the invitation to that level of presence is that you will hear and see things that are not common. Right? When Joshua sees that Moses had this, when Abraham sees that these men had this, and later on we see certain men serving men of God, Timothy serving Paul, we see history teaching us that you don't treat common what God has consecrated. One of the most underlying principles of elevation in the spirit is to know and discern when somebody is uniquely anointed or consecrated by God and to know how to deal with them in spite of who they are and where they are at, whether they elevate themselves, your part, your part really, what is your part in that place? It takes a certain understanding in God. When we get to the New Testament, the narrative changes. Okay, the narrative changes. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9, but it is written, I have not seen, no ear has heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things the Lord of God has prepared for them that love him. All right? And the Bible says, but God hath revealed those things unto us by his Spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things. For what man knoweth the things of the man, said the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. And he continues in verses 12. But we, the Bible says, have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given unto us by God. Which things, he says, we speak not in the words of which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. In fact, in one version, comparing spiritual people with spiritual things. This is what God is saying. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ came to break the dividing wall between man and God. Jesus came to reconcile man back to God of his fallen nature. You understand? And like James says, that Abraham was counted as a friend of God, James 2.23. He says, And Abraham believed God, and it was imputed of righteousness to him, and he was called a friend of God. This friendship 
Abraham had with God was not according to works. It was according to grace. It was according to the righteousness that was imputed on him because he believed, not necessarily works. When you become born again, that is the story of the New Testament. Jesus Christ becomes the propitiation of our sins, the reconciliation between man and God. He becomes the mediator of the new covenant, and his blood speaketh better things than the blood of Abel, because the blood of Abel speaks vengeance. The blood of Christ speaks love and reconciliation. When you and God are reconciled, you're no longer at odds. It means there will never be a time where you are not a friend of God and he's not your friend. And because he could not hide certain things from Moses, his servant, he had to tell him because he was his friend, could not hide things from Abraham because he was his friend. That's why he comes in Corinthians. He says, I have not seen, ear has not heard. It has not entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But he has revealed, he's not going to reveal, he has revealed these things unto us by his spirit. That means when it comes to you, the new creation, he has already revealed it in your spirit, in your regenerated spirit, in your new man, the new creation, which is in Christ. That stuff is all inside there. You have the present and the future all inside your spirit. He says, for the spirit of God searches the things of God. And he reveals to us, or he has revealed unto us the things that are freely given unto us by God. He's saying when it comes to you as a new creation, it's not even a place of seeking. Those things are inside you. He has already revealed to you the future to the end of the ages. It's all in your spirit because you will never be at odds with God. You have a righteousness by faith. And Christ becoming your righteousness all right, has put a reconciliation between you and God. And nothing will ever snatch you from his hand. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God which is revealed in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm persuaded of these things. Not things present, not things to come, not angels, nothing, no creation is able to separate us from the love of God which he has revealed in Christ Jesus. Not death, not pestilences, not trials, not testations, no life, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come. None of those things can be able to separate you from the love of God which he has revealed in Christ Jesus. And because that love is constant and it shall never leave, you are forever a friend of God by that default. And because of that, even further than that, he's not just revealing, it's already in your spirit. Next year is in your spirit. Next month is in your spirit. The next decade is in your spirit. The centuries to come are inside your spirit. He has revealed what I has not seen, he has not heard, and has not entered the hearts of men. It's in your spirit. But only a man with understanding can draw it out. So the seeker of the New Testament is not a seeker of things above only, but he's also a seeker of the things within him. The future is inside you. The next 10 years are inside you. The next 20 years are inside you. The next decade is inside you. To the coming of Christ, I carry that understanding of the future, and that is why I know that even when I'm long gone out of this flesh, my messages will be relevant to the return of Christ. Because some of us are no longer preaching for 2020. Some are. Some are preaching for 2015. Some of us are preaching to the end of the return of Christ. We are preaching to anything that will exist from now to the return of Christ. And whether we are long gone in the flesh of Christ is not back. So we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, our messages will stay relevant because we understand that all that the Father has given the Christ is now in our spirit through faith. So when I'm praying, I pray from that thing within that I know I have not seen. I will preach messages that have never been read in any book, had on any CD or preached by any man because I know it's inside my spirit. Rosa Talaba I'll do miracles that have never been hard in the history of humankind because I know it's in my spirit. You know, I'll carry my distinction in this life and this the Lord spoke to me years ago. Years ago. This is beyond, you know, hope. No, it's an understanding that I have in him. When I encountered him at a very young age, he spoke things to my spirit so beautiful. And up to today, I've not found the liberty to share with the people 
around me, but I said some of these I'll share when I'm in my last years of life. But it's important to tell you that our future, our destiny is another mistake. We might have made errors. I might have made errors as a man of God, but God's will concerning my life still stands, and I still hear him now like I first heard him when I was eight years old. He has walked with me. I have stayed conscious to that love and relationship that I share with him. And every time I close my eyes to draw from that thing within, I feel revelation come through. The Spirit of the Lord woke me up. It's probably two weeks ago. He woke me up. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning. And he began to speak. And I got my phone and I said to write. And from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., he spoke about 11 sermons. And he was speaking. And as I was writing, he tells me, that's done. Now write this. And I write and I write and I write. He says, that's done. Now write this. And I write and I write and says, that's done. Now I write this. And I write around and then when I finished these 11, in the morning I was speaking in tongues and I was all fired up in the spirit. And I knew why. When I saw these and I counted all these 11 sermons, he told me, keep them. I'll instruct you when to release them in the foreseeable future. Then he gave me understanding of why these 11 summons came the way they came. So we don't just preach because, oh, I'm seated there. I don't know what to preach on Sunday. Let me see what I can preach. No, we are beyond that. We are so connected to the spiritual timing of God because we understand that the responsibility, more so the apostolic office, is bigger than just the Sunday sermon or Thursday meeting to get to the next level of elevating men you know, toward God. It's a certain responsibility that sort of in the end, when men zoom out, they'll start to see Christ so fully has emolded and worked through us to contribute our part in this dispensation. Where are you with God in this season? You're his friend. What are the things you're digging from the inside of you? What are the things that God is dealing with you in the hour? Because if you never find that, you will never have a ministry. Father, we thank you. Oh, even as I'm speaking right now, I feel a mighty presence, a mighty anointing, a mighty glory, a mighty understanding, a mighty wisdom. I feel that heavenly atmospheres are shifting and positioning men before very great things that I even have no words to speak right now, but that the future will judge these days. And remember that certain men say these things. I pray for you even as you're listening to me, that may God make you relevant for your season and your time. May God connect you to the source of things that is available for the period and time. May he mold you and father you to the ministry that you are supposed to have in this world. May that which is in you touching the things to come, the future and destinies of men. Come out that your path will be clearly defined in the mighty name of Jesus. God is inviting you to a certain level, to a certain dwelling in the spirit realm. As things find you, he's also inviting your spirit to seek his heart and breath before him as a friend, that you might be elevated to certain conversations, that you might sit on a certain table of conversations. If Isaiah was not elevated to a certain place, he would not have heard whom shall we send. But because one man on the earthly plane interceded before and as he was in his wading in the spirit realm, he was elevated into the heavenly places and he interrupted the conversation of whom shall we send. That is the thing that defines Isaiah in his time besides any other prophet that existed in his time. And that is the thing that defines your distinction, your pattern lot in your time. And may you find it May you find it. May you go beyond simply asking for a job, a cry, a husband, children, and, you know, deliverance to a place where you will find your path and lot in the message, in the gospel, in the time, because there are people I'm speaking to right now, and I can sense the greatness in your spirit. I can sense the heavy callings, the heavy great mantles on your lives, and that God has not called you to be an average man or an average woman. He has called you to change your generation, to change the future, to have a say in the next 100 years to come, to do things that will echo through to eternity and will be defined even to the end of the ages. And I pray that may God give you the understanding of the things he's saying in this hour. In the mighty name of Jesus, I prayed and believed. Amen. And I pray for you if you're sick in your body. Be healed. Leave that you'll serve your God. Be free from poverty that you'll serve your God. Be reconciled in your marriage relationships that you'll serve your God. 
May your children have peace and be reconciled in their lives so you will serve God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I believe that great miracles have taken place in this hour. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. If you're there and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you say, you know what, today I want to receive Jesus. I feel that God is inviting me to a greater call and responsibility in this hour. There's a reason why I'm alive in this season. I want to give you an opportunity right now to pray with you. All right? Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I've heard your word. My heart connects to you. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Now, today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Venero. Venero, make manifest.